Welcome back to Senate Education. It's two o'clock. And we are shifting gears uh, to S-284, an act relating to the use of electronic devices and digital and online products in schools, a bill that uh, was entered by uh, Senator Williams and others. And we've been having this conversation. We had the Attorney General in. We've heard from some uh, school personnel and administrators. And we thought this is a public health issue. Uh, and we wanted to hear from our commissioner, Dr. Mark Levine. So thank you for joining us. I'm just looking at Senator Williams. Is there anything that you want to say before we get started about the bill at this point? Okay. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Commissioner Mark Levine, Department of Health. Um, I don't have slideshows. Okay. Uh, I can provide my comments to you after. No. Um, so thanks for inviting me to testify. Um, this is clearly an important topic. Um, perhaps your previous testimony indicated to you it's a controversial as well. Um, I will tell you that the testimony I'm going to give reflects uh, my own knowledge in the area, that of my uh, Department of Health, uh, Family and Child Health Division particularly, and we have closely collaborated with colleagues in the Department of Mental Health as well. So this is sort of a consensus opinion that you're going to see. Okay. Um, so to start with, we do appreciate um, the legislature's paying attention to the mental health of kids, youth, and for acknowledging the increasing complexity of social media, the internet, and screen time in the lives of Vermonters in general. We also appreciate the acknowledgement that we all have a role to play in, in this, whether it's schools themselves, whether it's families, whether it's healthcare providers, whether it's communities. Now, we're all in this together. And we uh, completely support the idea of minimizing and reducing exposure to social media while in school through school policies that support educational focus. But we also feel that this bill may be a bit heavy handed and unrealistic in that regard. It's important uh, that we recognize mental health, suicide ideation are very complex and multifaceted phenomena. Um, and I fear that at times we're conflating social media and emergency room visits for suicidal ideation. Um, because the work we've done in the Department of Health and the Department of Mental Health indicates it's much more complex than that. And uh, we would hate that we would leave with an overly simplistic approach that one bill will remedy uh, a real crisis in the youth's mental health. Uh, public messaging or legislation that is uh, somewhat alarmist or fear based. Um, like smartphones are destroying, you know, the next generation of uh, our country, um, doesn't reflect the science that accurately. It can actually make families and educators feel a little overwhelmed and without hope. Um, and I think if we look at how youth might perceive it, it could be a bit looked at by them as a bit accusatory. Um, and maybe disempowered. Um, complicated issues, like always, uh, and complicated problems require sometimes complicated solutions uh, that are precise. And it may not be overly conducive to overly broad and reactive policy solutions. Um, I also want to acknowledge the difference between educational platforms and social media, um, because that distinction needs to be clear. Educational platforms in the public school setting are very widely used, and by many, very widely accepted. Um, and we need to not sacrifice their value while we're trying to work on the aspects of social media that might be more detrimental. 
And I'm not here to deny that social media uh, doesn't come with its own set of problems uh, that the legislation acknowledges quite well. Um, I'm just here to say that social media is here and it's perhaps not all that. Um, there are protective factors <clears throat> that social media can provide for adolescents, such as social support, ability to connect with like-minded peers, connections with friends and family, civic engagement, planning events, building larger networks based on interests. As you know, we do a lot of surveying through a number of tools, the best known of which is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And you know, we do find that some of the aspects of social media can be protective to support children and youth who you might be concerned have what we would term marginalized identities, whether they be in the BIPOC community, in the LGBTQ plus community, uh, where we see alarming rates, much higher than in the average person rates of social isolation, mental health challenges, experiencing loneliness. I mean, that, that's just where the evidence is. <laughs> and we know that LGBTQ youth have considerably higher mental health struggles and higher rates of suicidal ideation, and that sometimes they find hope and community online. The American Academy of Pediatrics notes that interventions must center the child or adolescent by providing support for autonomy, advancing skills in digital citizenship and literacy, supporting self-regulation, and encouraging parental role modeling and open-minded conversation. So the goal being support and empower the youth. If we deleted all social media, we will not have solved the youth mental health crisis and would likely further disenfranchise and potentially endanger many youth. Now, there are, moving away from the AAP, there are healthy pro social ways to be on social media. Uh, we have to prioritize the youth perspective with an open mind and help kids and parents understand their agency in controlling what they see on social media and in controlling what is private and what is not. Now, in a lot of the public speaking I do, I very much harp on the social isolation theme. In public health circles, social isolation is the root of all the things we see that are going on for people in our population, no matter what age they are. Um, so myriad public health problems emanating from social isolation. We also know it's a very good predictor of suicidal ideation. So while I worry about youth becoming isolated due to over-reliance on smartphones and social media, thinking they are connected, where in fact they're avoiding connection because they're doing it all electronically, it's also true that social media can provide for many youth an element of social connectedness that they otherwise wouldn't have at all. The risks of social media use are linked with various factors and highly complex. Population level correlations of time spent on social media and mental health are very small. Much of the research is, has limitations and doesn't control for other factors that might be child or home related that explain the link between social media and well being of children. Results are often mixed. And they don't consistently show a causal relationship, cause effect. We also know that teens use social media and how it, how they do use it really determines its impact. And there's a fair amount of research going on, which really looks at how much time is spent on platforms. Is it used in the evening? Is it related to poor sleep? Is it passively used or more actively used in terms of the participation of the individual? How much control is one exerting on the content that's delivered? For instance, turning off likes, refreshing the algorithm, disengaging from content that impacts mood or mental health. 
I would like to see us focus more on health, edu health education, which of course you would expect someone in public health to say. Um, and from my educator hat that I had for many years in healthcare and medicine and still wear, uh, building our children's critical thinking skills. Just like the most important to, to thing to me in dealing with medical students and residents was, can they critically reason? Do they have critical thinking skills? So I agree there's a need for education around the risks of social media and online access. And I do believe it's happened, although probably not consistent. Vermont's health education standards support the development of skills necessary to adopt, practice, and maintain health enhancing behaviors that would ensure they have the skills to navigate these complexities. And I think if we could lean into this, that would be great. Using strength-based language and promoting opportunities for adults in the school buildings to navigate conversations and authentically engage with our youth. And then looking to what national organizations have said in terms of these organizations that are devoted to children, to child health, to mental health, and well-being. It's hard to find one that suggests outright banning of social media. They do offer guidance on how to move forward thoughtfully. And we can link you to the American, so American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychological Association, and the Academy of Children and Adolescent Psychiatrists. These all present social media advisory language and relevant resources. I also want to speak about our Surgeon General of the United States. In his 2023 advisory, the call to action, which was a very important call to action regarding the effects of social media on youth mental health, he advocated for gaining a fuller understanding of the full impact of social media use, maximizing the benefits, minimizing the harms of social media platforms, and creating safer, healthier online environments to protect children. He didn't call for an all out ban necessarily. Also, coming as a public health official to you, you would be shocked if I didn't mention the word equity and looking at that through that kind of a lens. Um, so there can be unintentional impacts, which I think you've debated in this committee already. Uh, regarding the use of social media to communicate with families, in case of school closings, emergency, other immediate needs, concerns about the so-called opt-out of digital curriculum for families or teachers, which probably, well, could be viewed as a uh, inequitable practice uh, for, diver for diverse sets of learners. Um, concerns about teachers' capacity to be able to ensure their students have the resources they need to learn and the additional stress this may cause the students. <clears throat> sort of a standard where a teacher might need potentially to have two sets of lessons plans um, that might be kind of hard to implement or overly burdensome on you. But I'm not here to speak for teachers. That's just our thoughts. Libraries may offer digital access to books or audio books, and taking away that access could limit, taking, implementing legislation could limit this access for some children. And it could result in harsh and inconsistent reactive disciplinary actions against students that might have lasting consequences. And I won't even begin to speculate on the impact of uh, sort of a rigid policy that might impact teachers and administrators as enforcers. I already know what that looks like with vaping crisis, and it's not a comfortable place for them to be, um, yet they play that role uh, admirably, but stressfully. Um, I should also, though, discuss what we in mental health and public health can do in a positive way. Uh, to bring to this conversation. So our uh, department and its Family and Child Health Division and the Department of Mental Health would be glad to enter into partner with 
the agency of education to develop sample policy protocol about use of personal devices and social media in learning environments based on evidence-based practice and in partnership with AAP, uh, school nurses, school leadership. Something we're kind of familiar with doing you know, in many other topic areas. Um, same groups of us would be glad to partner with AOE to support schools and applying health education standards to social media, internet use, and screen time. Our Family Child Health Division is currently supporting a year-long quality improvement project around social media counseling and support in pediatric primary care. Uh, and we're partnering with Vicha, the Child Health Improvement Program, uh, starting in the fall. Um, and we've been involved in the planning process for this as well. So in conclusion, um, we're not sure it feels realistic for the response to be to take it all away. And I think we would be better off focusing on applying guidelines for usage. For instance, no cell phone use in class or hallways, whatever, that kind of a protocol. And providing comprehensive education about the risks of the internet and social media and what healthy and safe usage looks like. The issue of collecting data on children and youth uh, should be addressed at a higher level in terms of developers and regulators and not at the school or district level. Sort of restrictions and regulations on the companies and platforms and creators do need to be established. And I think we've all seen the recent news that indicates that these are being discussed in Washington uh, and here in Montpelier. Um, if we truly want to focus on positive health outcomes for youth, then we need to give them support and guidance to make healthy choices by focusing on positive relationships, healthy supportive environments, encouragement, and emotional growth. And in the spirit of a developmentally informed child and family-centered approach, the onus should be on the problems inherent in the platforms, not within the child or the youth. So I will stop there. Questions. So, can we get a copy of your? Yes, data? I, I, the, the, I will have it sent within the uh, app. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the whole bill doesn't mention banning. So, um, I've heard from a lot of uh, teachers that are, some are going to testify next week that say that if they had the phone away from the student, that they would pay more attention yeah. to learning. And uh, there are some schools in Vermont that already have the opt out uh, policy. So we're going to hear it from all of them. But I, right. I, I appreciate your willingness to work to develop uh, educational platforms. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, family child health within the realm of public health, this is what we do. Right? We are so partnered with the education community. Um, this would just be yet another aspect of that, as opposed to something so unique and novel that we could work. Yeah. So this is this is clearly where we're at time. And, and this impact on mental health, I mean, it is so real. You know? um, but as we said in our casual comments before the tape was turned on, I mean, this is this is large, this is huge, and it is so multifaceted, facet complex. Um, and in many ways, it intersects with crisis and suicidal ideation, as well as suicide itself. Um, but so many things. I thank you for your question. You might say a couple of words about what the agency is doing right now related to public health, um, sort of like information campaign around this. Are you engaged in a way that we see commercials all the time, not all the time, but smoking, baking, yeah, yeah, yeah. alcohol, that kind of thing. Are, are, is the agency involved in this? Um, in the suicide aspect, okay, sure. Um, as it relates to the digital devices. Well, not as it relates to digital devices, but as it relates to 
resources that people can draw upon, Got it. which can then direct them for help in kind of deals, whatever you're dealing with. So we have the obviously the emergency call numbers and the engagement. Yes. Yeah. But then we have more importantly the facing suicide VT website, which is sort of Vermonter's own lived experience. Uh, survivors yeah. of suicide attempts as well as family members of those who unfortunately have succumbed to suicide. And I mean that has so many topics and issues that people can relate to on it. Uh, and resources to direct them to. Um, we also have a fair amount of media coverage on just mental health in general and accessing mental health resources. Um, it's a little harder to say we have focused exclusively on electronic devices that that obviously could be the next generation of uh, media that we do. Um, and, and you're very familiar, I'm sure, with, well, you actually won't be familiar with what we do on substance use with youth, because unless I underestimated you, you're not on the websites that this material is on. You're not on the social media platforms that this material is underused around all the time. And they click at very high levels, uh, whether it's on vaping, whether it's on cannabis use, whether it's substance use general. Um, uh, you know, tobacco industry, you name it, uh, I have no reason to believe they would behave differently with regard to this. They, they, they see the problems in their space. They understand and know, and maybe they don't always see the problem in themselves uh, until it gets down the road a bit, uh, but they see it for sure. So one uh... One thing I heard you mention was your willingness to partner with the agency of education to yes. create a model policy that we could then perhaps put forward to our schools as a, if you're going to move in this direction, here's a model policy that you might want to adopt, something like that. Is that the way you're thinking about it? Yeah, you, you've gone down the road a, path, a bit already, but yes, okay. we would certainly be on that pathway. For sure. Is there anything else that you can be that you're thinking about that should be on our minds and our agenda as it relates to social media. Yeah, so so I mentioned the three organizations mm -hmm. and the Surgeon General's report, mm -hmm. and you, there'll be links within what you get uh, after this meeting that I would advise you look at with regard to this topic. Okay. Because um, these are youth and mental health directed bodies of the thoughtful bodies. Um, and then you also mentioned partnering with the agency of education, others to look at those health education standards as it relates yes. again to right. using this. Right. Well, I don't think anybody's against. No, yeah, no, I, I, I'm just it's trying not to, to be against any of this. It's just right. trying to, I think, um, navigate pathway that isn't sort of all or none right. um, and isn't uh, ignoring it or overly heavy handed, but that tries to you know, forge a path forward that empowers you, empowers educators, um, acknowledges that some of this is like at the regulatory level for some of these platforms, et cetera, and is happening in Montpelier in Washington as we speak, uh, whether we invoke the what are we doing in schools or not? Um, so I'm just trying to bring all that together. I, I think, you know, I don't want to call it middle of the road because it's not middle of the road. It's it's just um, proactive in a slightly different direction. Please, Senator Chief. Yeah, thank, thank you for your testimony. Um, so I, I guess just a general comment. Uh, definitely in big support of the education piece that, that you were describing and you know, working with AOE to get that education out there so that teachers can explain to kids, you know, the dangers of, you know, or, you know, dangers of certain aspects of social media and so on. I think that's that's a good idea. Um, and, you know, regarding the phones in general, I mean, it, 
Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, my, I mean, my belief on it is, you know, if you're at school, the phones should be in the locker, you know, and that's really right. just the condensed, uh, my, my condensed thoughts on the issue of anger. I have a constituent who also happens to be my daughter who agrees with that, <laughs> so I think she does. We don't like to make yeah, a move. She can't help it. She can't help it. She can't help it. But no, I did bring this up, and she was like, why don't we just, well, just require us to put them in the lockers, and it seems like a middle road approach. But, but her school, yeah. as it's here, does not require that. No. No, okay. So yeah. I think, yeah. uh, yeah, and I, and I get it's dependent on the school district and what they're requiring, and I, I get there can be some challenges, you know, like maybe with after school programs and kids going from one place to another, but I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think of different aspects of it, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, I, the phone should be in the lockers during the school day, that's, you know, that's what that's well, No, I'm, I'm with you, yeah, you know, yeah. when we talk about vaping, mm -hmm. remember the Juul devices? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so the jewel devices, they didn't have to go to the bathroom to use them. Mm -hmm. Like their backpack, which is by their chair, they would like lean over to get some papers out of the backpack yeah. and take a quick hit on their jewel device. Yeah, and they're also like, sweaters. The same thing will happen yeah. with the phone. If the phone is there, so I got to text somebody. Yeah. And, and there were also um, hoodies that were designed exactly. in such a way yes. that you could take a hit of whatever the thing is while you're wearing your sweater. And, it's like, wow. and, I, and I guess one other thing, I didn't put it this precisely in comments, but we all know what the keep kids away from drug campaigns, the impact of just say no, or, and Nancy Reagan and all of that, you know, it's like, those were failures, you know, I can't yeah. just tell you, don't do this, it's bad for you. Um, and then expect enforcement to take over and nobody can do anything. And so I don't, I don't want to totally equate what we're talking about here to that, but a lot of it is sort of like if you just tell them it's bad and you say you can't do it in school um, and you don't have anything constructive built around it to empower them in ways that can be protected as well, um, it might have the same kind of reaction. Speaking of constituents, uh, so we need the rest of the story. We're wondering what your daughter's recommendation is on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> on the best? Yes. Uh, I, I brought it up to her, and her recommendation was, why don't you just require putting the phones in the locker? Okay, that was very good. Was, it's also my, good. but it's... It was hers. I, I'm giving her yeah, the you did, you did claim it for yourself a moment ago, <laughs> okay. knowing that she believes right. yeah, yeah. she's she's gonna watch the tape be mad. Now she needs uh, to weigh in on the social media part. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I think as I was listening to you, I think I heard um some suggestions, sort of um subtle suggestions, but um varying from platform regulation to educating parents, giving kids opportunities so that they can avoid isolation, which could be a panoply of things. And then um, then I sort of focused or landed on bullying, hazing, and harassment, um, because that's something that comes up in this committee oh, quite a bit. And we're always struggling with what to do and how to, how to handle it. The, as the um, Commissioner of Health, do you have, I don't know, suggestions for us or um, strategies or, or anything that could be useful. Yeah. So th this is where it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because the same community of youth that might say this is leading to bullying and harassment and ruining my life, is also other members of that same community are saying, this has given me the connectivity that I really need because my community, whether it's fine by the sexual orientation or racially or what have you, um, has found itself here. It's very challenging. And that's where I think the precision of regulatory and policy change can be helpful, uh, as opposed to perhaps an umbrella kind of regulatory policy change. And so the nuances of that, I think we're happy to, to work in a constructive way. Do you think we could ever make the the school that community again so that when they're not tied up with their phones that they can actually communicate with each other and you know have lunch with each other? Because 
they do tend to, to be on their phones when they have free time. Right. So, yeah, that's a culture thing, right? It's a culture. It's not the schools, right? Probably it's a, it's everybody. But if we if we create that environment for them, that you know, some sometimes we don't know what's good for us. And I I completely endorse it. Right. Yeah, I, I I mean I I've had to visit a lot of schools as part of this job over these right. last years and years. So it's incredible what some of them are doing. Uh, but it's also incredible the problems they're encountering. And so every good seems like every positive step. Mm -hmm. That leads to progress. Something else happens, and then we take a step back. Right. Uh, so it's a, it's really a culture change kind of thing, which is really hard to do because it's the culture they see beyond the walls of their school, in their own homes, and in their communities. And they can still they can still do that after school. Yes, they can do it on the bus. Sure. Um, I was just going to follow up with that. I see. I think that is a problem that the grown-ups, that the adults, can fix. Yes, I think, heard that. Yeah, we, yeah, we need to invest in more after-school programs. Invest in our community partners. Yeah. Invest in sports, music. I mean, every kid should be doing an extracurricular, right? Whether you're a great basketball player or not, you should be given the opportunity to to do that. I know in Burlington, we used to have a space called. I think it was 250 or 450 Main, and it was underneath Memorial Auditorium, and it was this really cool music and art space, and kids would go there and spend, you know, the weekend and after school and evenings, and it was, I mean, talk about, you're, you're breaking down isolation yeah. because everyone's in there working together and having a good time, and it's gone because that building's condemned. But those are the kinds of spaces that we need to create for kids. Was that the high school underneath? It was a little more right on Main right, Street. Right, it was right, so great. Right. But I mean, those, those yeah. are things that we have to do. You know, the kids can't really do that. Right. So, you know, yeah, we need to build that. Yeah. Yeah. And this committee doesn't hear from me that often, but this is what I talk about in other committees because the whole Icelandic model, uh, the after school activities that would try to ramp up with Governor and Senator Sanders during the pandemic and in the summertime, so much as after school, the third space that we call it. That's how we combat social isolation. And that's how we answer the one question on the youth risk behavior survey that sets me the most, which is close to 50% of our youth say they don't feel like they matter to their community. 50%. 50%. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little less. So it's not half, but it's so close to half. Uh, that say they don't feel like they matter to the community, that the adults don't, don't even see them, they don't care who they are and know who they are. And so the programs like uh, we're talking about here build that whole thing because they're used, endorsed, and driven, their voice is there. But beyond that, their um, adults in the community are creating opportunities that wouldn't have existed. And maybe the other committee members have seen that survey. Where can we get the, the results of that survey? The YRBS? Yeah. I'll send you oh, a link yeah. to that. Oh, yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're going to switch gears. Yeah. Mr. Anderson? Thank, Thank you, Dr. Levine. Thank, Thank you. Senator so Kitchell will appreciate that could be any time for her. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want to have to tell her that I was Senator Campion. Uh, uh, like, it's funny is that she just texted and she said, where the hell is yeah, it? Right. <laughs> 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 I take it the next subject is not on this. Not, nah, yeah. Thank you very much, Doctor. Good to see you. Dr. Strand. Nice to see you. Nice to see you all. For the record, Dr. Anderson, Legislative Council. Uh, we are looking at S220. Your uh, uh, and what we have here in our folders, we have response from uh, written response from uh, is uh, Catherine Del Neo. Thank you again for that. Oh, it looks like you have very nicely presented us with this as sort of decision points. That is correct. So you have uh, a summary of the sections of the bill Beautiful. put in as concise Beautiful. and plainly written language as possible so that you can make a decision on each uh, provision of the bill based Great. on the recommendations you received so far. Great. So if the committee's comfortable with it, I'll 
I work through the summary if there are specific questions about the bill contents to dive into it. And you have the recommendations from the state librarian side as you can make some of your informed decisions along the way. And we have the state librarian because yes, it's probably so you know. I actually haven't had the privilege of meeting in person oh, yet. So yeah, there she is. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Um, here we all are. Here we, we all are. So um, the intent section is not included in summary. And to briefly note, that's because the decisions you make in the sections that follow will impact whether that is even necessary to the bill. So as I noted in the initial walkthrough, some of the factual findings and the expression of intent relate to potential court review at a later date on some of the constitutional issues that might arise. Um, so if those provisions are removed from the bill, you might not even want to proceed with an intent section. So noting that, the first chunk of the bill that we'll look at is section two, which relates to the licensing of electronic literary products. The um, you know, simple way to explain what this is doing is that it is going to govern the relationship between publishers and public libraries in the state with respect to the licensing of things like audiobooks and ebooks. Um, so it adds a new subchapter to 22 VSA Chapter 3 that establishes prohibited provisions for those contracts. And the prohibited provisions include disproportionate pricing between what is offered to libraries and what is otherwise offered to the public, and then restrictions on things like licensing the products to library users, uh, loaning electronic literary materials to borrowers or through interlibrary loan systems, and the number of licenses that a library may acquire. In general, it's targeting contracts that attempt to restrict um, the duration, for example, of a borrower's temporary license to use an ebook or an audiobook from a library. Uh, the section then goes on to define the use of a prohibited provision in the contract as an unfair and deceptive trade practice pursuant to the state's consumer protection laws. Okay. So, section two in the original bill, please, were you going to help me out in terms of explaining reading assessment? No, I, I, I'm I, just, go ahead. I was wondering, should, would you prefer running through the whole thing first and then having us comment at the end or comment along the way? However, the committee would like to operate. I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, I, I just, if it's all right, periodically just sort of check in because like, for example, this section is going to be, this is the section that you mentioned early on. Yeah. I think it's going to be a little bit um, exciting, dare I say controversial. Um, but I just want to know what was in section two versus what this proposal is. Uh, it's so section two is exactly the same. Oh, the summary it's, it's, is just this looking is, at this the bill as interest for the purposes okay. of the decisions that the committee wants to okay. make. Yes. Okay. So no changes have been made in the bill at all at this point. Please. Where I'm confused, yeah. and perhaps the state librarian will be able to chime in with that. I feel as though the language in the bill was sort of lifted out of the report that was uh, shared. And, but now it seems as though the Department of Libraries isn't in favor of it. So I guess I just need some clarity as to, it seems like there was a report that said, do this, and now we're being, yeah. it's like, don't do this. So maybe I've misinterpreted that. Please, if you don't mind no. jumping in. Sure, that's a... a a good question, and I'm happy to clarify. Uh, Catherine Delnau, the state librarian, and uh, the working groups, a different entity from the department, and that's one really important thing to to call out. So, as the chair of the working group, my role was to represent. I felt my role was to represent the will of the group, um, and the the working group recommended that the legislature look at this issue, but we were not. The working group was not prescriptive in how it would be addressed. So I think this is absolutely, this section, um, section 162 on page five, it's absolutely a response of the legislature. We didn't say what to do because we didn't have expertise in that. Upon looking at the actual language, and I've had, um, well, Mr. Anderson and I haven't met before, I did see the language just before you saw it um, introduced, and I believe my comments at the time were 
kind of whoa Nelly, like this is a lot. <laughs> um, it may be I I'm not confident I understand exactly what would what the results of this language would be because it's in this public library bill, but the way that it's written, if any contract First off, this is a public library bill, but there are school libraries mentioned, and the intent includes academic libraries as well. So there's a little bit of confusion about would this really just apply to the public library setting? How would it impact even the consumer's ability to get materials? If the if the vendor's not willing to send us, if the distributor's not willing to sell us materials in public libraries for the same price that you get them at home, would they stop selling the materials to all of us in the public libraries, <laughs> possibly? And would that mean that they couldn't sell them to you at home either? I have no idea. I'm not a legal expert in this. So that's where I was saying, could we maybe slow this portion down and work on a on a longer term right. solution? Um, I've I'm, I believe I'm considered one of the co-lead sponsors, and I, but I'd have to speak to what the other lead sponsor. I, I'm not necessarily wedded to this section. Is it your opinion or your suggestion that we strike uh, section 162? I would strike this, but I would welcome looking at this for future legislation and trying to develop something that could address this very important concern of the pricing and the unfair practice of pricing. There, there is a problem here. I'm just not sure that this is the so this exact language is the solution. Yeah. But is anyone opposed to us taking it out at this point? We can always return to it at another day down the road. But it looks like we'll strike section two. Okay. Unless, yeah, please. I was ready to pivot already. The section is three five, three three five. But it's beautiful. Okay. I, I love your efficiency. It's great. This is, yeah, you'll see this committee. It's like, I don't know what other committees you go to, but <laughs> gold standard. I won't name that because I don't want to have their. I'll take over. <laughs> <laughs> um, sections three through five is going to be on pages seven through nine. This relates to the selection and retention of library materials. And primarily, what this is concerned with is the reconsideration of materials, the removal of books from public libraries. So these sections propose to amend various provisions of Title 22 to require public libraries to adopt a policy for the selection and retention of library materials. Those policies must comply with the First Amendment and certain federal and state laws relating to, for example, non-discrimination. The Department of Libraries in a later section is granted discretionary authority to adopt model policies for selection and retention. So the way that this may work, for example, is that the Department of Libraries would adopt a model policy governing selection and retention, and then the public libraries can simply adopt that model policy as their own. And this would govern, for example, the procedures for how the public could request that material be removed from a library and then the standards complying with the First Amendment that would be applied in reviewing whether that material should be reconsidered. So two people walk into a library. One, the library has an autobiography of Joe Biden and an autobiography of Donald Trump. And they, those two people, respectively, want to remove one or the other. This kind of puts in a process so that Libraries can assess and say, and then sort of make a decision based on First Amendment rights, et cetera. Right. In okay. compliance with First Amendment jurisprudence. Okay. Questions? No. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to form it. Uh, you know, a lot of our conversation here is about local control. And I'm just kind of wondering what we're solving here with this language. Can I? I, um, I just want to see if anybody on the committee wants to weigh in on that first, or the council. There still is an element of local control here. The backbone of these sections is ensuring that the library has a procedure in place for re review. The library or the Vermont the guidance guidelines. The specific see. public library. They do not have to use any of the model policies. They could adopt their own policy provided that it complies with the First Amendment and any applicable state or federal laws. Right. Yeah. 
So this is creating a model policy that can or cannot be anything short of that because the base requirement is just that a public library have a policy in place that will be followed when they're reviewing a request for reconsideration. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can speak to the sort of maybe the genesis of this or part of the genesis, which was I originally wanted to write a ban on book bans. Like that was my, I really wanted to do that because it seemed like a great idea and I was all excited about it. And then um, Catherine and I had many long conversations and she um, expressed to me the importance of, um, you know, not banning free speech, basically. And so we, this is sort of, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a, um, a, a happy, you know, medium, middle ground, but we decided that instead of banning book bans, maybe we could have these robust policies in place to make sure that um, there was a standard across the state around how, how, what it would look if someone wants to ban a book and what libraries have to do to make sure that their collection is sound and safe. Just a clarification in how, in, in this language. So, you know, I'm looking at line 10 on page eight, public libraries shall adopt a policy for the selection and reconsideration of library materials that complies with dot, 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 state laws prohibiting discrimination in the place of accommodation. How does that, how would that play out? Like, what would that look like? Can you provide more clarification on how does it enforce or what it, what it really means? As far as the adoption of the policy or some of the specific references to state federal law here? Yeah, I was using state law as, as an example, but uh, yeah, can, can you just provide a little more uh, information on this? So I'll start with the easy answer, which is that there's no enforcement built into these provisions and there's no mandatory oversight. So for example, the Department of Libraries is not gonna be reviewing a library's policy to ensure that it complies with the First Amendment. The duty is applied here. So perhaps an aggrieved member of the public who is upset with the way the policy was applied to a specific request for reconsideration could bring a complaint, but there's also no provision in here for a private right of action to be brought against a library. So I am sure you're familiar with from Senate Judiciary. Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, the, the state laws surrounding discrimination, for example, already do apply to places of public accommodation. And so, and I, and I want them to obviously, but are we just, are we, is this language, you know, aside from requiring every library to adopt a model policy, it, are, are we just restating what's already law in this? Yes. They have to comply with the First Amendment as well without us stating it here expressly. So, yes. Okay. The only operative provision here is the requirement for the policy to be adopted. Go. Thank you. Senator Weeks, Senator Senator Who, who's the Who's the intended adjudicator? Would it be the select board, the local select board? In this, yeah. in this case, it would yeah. be the trustees, directors, or managers of the public library, depending on what we're talking about, whether it's a municipal library or a municipally funded, you know, association library that's providing free public library services to a community. Right. Senator Williams? You go ahead. Is done there? Um, if I can just share a, quickly share some context for this, um, public libraries are currently supposed to all have selection development and reconsideration policies, and uh, an informal quick survey shows that they do not. Um, their policies are already supposed to be in, con in confirmation with the current laws in our state, including they are places of public accommodation. So all of the categories of individuals who are protected in the public accommodation law, it is important that the policies meet that law and also the First Amendment. They they do not. They're very confused. They've been asking the department for model policies. Libraries in Vermont want to do the right thing, I think, with their policies, and they want to have um, the principles of intellectual freedom and have the book on both 
the former president and the current president on the shelf. Um, and books on diverse religions, you know, including Christianity, they they want to do these things, but they need a little bit of support. They still would have local control. We would simply have the authority to develop the model policy and share it with them. They could quickly adopt that, or they could use it as a starting point to adopt their own. They don't have to adopt the model policy. So I want to clarify, there is a, a degree to which it is a little bit redundant because they should already be following this, but the reality is these are libraries led by community members who may not have experience in the law and they may not realize what applies to them, so codifying it in this way would be... Yeah, so I get an alibi here, so kind of lead into what uh, Senator Sheep said. Um, so is there, is it, is there a Vermont constitutional uh, provision that applies here? Because we're this once this passes, that's going to become law. It's going to go into statute. But we're talking about just preparing a policy that uh, uh, municipal or local libraries can use. So, are we mandating? Are we okay? It's to, to the extent that there are any Vermont constitutional provisions that would govern, for example, speech rights right. associated with this process. Those constitutional provisions are going to apply without specifically calling them okay. clear. And this won't, you know, not including specific references to those provisions, is not going to exclude them from any constitutional analysis in the future. So we're giving guidance. We would be, the department would give guidance. Um, the department would work with the local, the, the State Library Association, um, just engage the community in, in the process of making the model policy. But um, I also want to be sure that um, the one element, the, the reconsideration policy, the policy for retention includes maintaining the public's right to petition the library. We don't want to, as, as Senator Felix was saying, we don't want to cut off that avenue to people. Some of the other bills may not even do that, but they are called like, the ban on book bans, and it, it may be a misnomer, but we want to be sure that the public, if they see something on the shelf that they're concerned about, they go through that normal process. That's something that we do in school libraries, in public libraries. Um, we want to uphold that right to petition, in many cases, the, the municipal library, but even when it's an incorporated library, it's still their town's library. So we want that dialogue to continue in the community. That's that's a healthy discourse, uh, but within a framework so that the institutions of the libraries are protected, so the staff have guidance and the, the trustees have a, a kind of a roadmap on how do we do that? What's the formal process for it? Section six. This relates to the confidentiality of library and patron records, and what this would do is lower the age from 16 to 12 for purposes of confidentiality of patron records. So under current law, patron records have mandatory confidentiality built into them, and those records cannot be disclosed to any person except to the, in this subdivision, parents or legal guardians, of a person 16 years of age or younger. And this would lower that to 12. Um, and in case it comes up, there is a private right of action built into this set of laws so that a library patron whose information has been disclosed to any other party can sue the public library. Questions? Please. Yeah, I'm really challenged by this section. You guys know that. Yeah. And it's, you know, to me, it's not about uh, young kids seeking um, gender affirming information or what have you. It's actually quite the opposite. It's, you know, kids that might be uh, researching suicide methods or, God help us, you know, palm making methods. You know, the, the imagination just runs wild, right? And for a parent not to be involved in that, you know, I have, real, I have real challenges with that because there are certain things parents need to be engaged with. Uh, to remove that, I think, is, uh, is a problem. Uh, of course, there's always exceptions. There's households that don't have that. You know, there's abuse going on, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel that we also have a, a number of mechanisms in place in the state that address uh, 
that scenario and then would remove the capability of that abusive parent or whatever the relationship is uh, from uh, you know this uh, from this protecting them in this type of scenario protecting the child but but you know for the other 98 percent of the population I feel that parents remain engaged so so to me the, this one section makes the, the bill a deal killer but that's you know doesn't matter you know what we think you know we can easily be outvoted on on that aspect but that what particular section is completely troubles so man if you want to add anything about the process or any because yeah take for example the suicide question mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that came up in the discussions it, it did and senator i really appreciate your sharing where your trouble with this section comes from and actually the the matter of suicide is one of the reasons that we in the working group have recommended lowering the age so for example um well what we recommended the specific age we ended up on as a group consensus of the working group was 12, specifically because in Vermont law currently, children who are 12 years of age can independently seek mental health help. And there may be parents who don't want them to seek mental health, who don't believe in mental health help, who have concerns with psychiatric care. If the child knows that they are having some issues and is trying to they're trying to address that and learn about that and to, to follow the path to get some help. And even in a situation we, um, when I was here I think last week um, with Mary Danko from the Fletcher Free Library or two weeks ago, she was using examples of kids she's seen who are in abusive situations who come to the library, who ask questions and learn information. And if they're abusing, if they're abusive parent, knew that they were doing that, the child might not right. be able to take the steps to get the help. That's what so, I mentioned about yeah, it's, exceptions. There's always exceptions. Right. I get that. But this is not a, a, a rule, uh, an exception-based rule. This is a rule. Well, it's really, the recommendation is based on lowering the age to gather information to match the age that the child is currently empowered to make autonomous medical decisions on the topics of Challenge for that too. Okay, if you want to yeah. visit uh, health and welfare, you guys had that last year. Well, no, we have a you know, we have a there's a bill about uh, STD. Who had a great STD? Right. Right. That's one fifty prevention. Yeah, so you know it's the same concept. Just because it's uh, done somewhere else and some other time doesn't mean it. You know, I can't speak up for the constituents who are quite upset about this concept. Yeah, and, and I, I appreciate that. But as far as how did we, how did the working group come to this recommendation? It was really with the idea that if there is that child, I think for most children, I I talked to an 11 year old, not my child, but a child I, I live with. And I asked her, who do you want your dad to see your library card? And she said, of course, he checks the books out with me. We always go together. Many children won't they'll still share their cards with their parents. They're, they still have those good relationships with their parents. Their parents will still know what they're reading. This is really the, the idea here is to give those children who are in that situation where they need to make health decisions around drug and alcohol treatment and around mental health, the ability to go in and get that information that they need to make the decision that for them can be a life or death decision. So that's that's really aligning that age, bringing it down to 12, um, is that was the intention of the working group's recommendation. Good. And I do, I Thank appreciate you. hearing from you and I respect that perspective. Senator um, Lamps, that's an issue. Well, this is a uh, prescription for a drug that I can't see it, but let's read it, but it's the 12 year old was trying to read that and understand it. I don't think they have the mental capability to do that at 12 years old. So that's why I didn't support it. Um, I think we're, you know, the age of consent from what I understand is 16 right now. And, and well, I think we have an even wall. All right, Thanks, I, I see the, um, the asterisks there. And so I, I know that means that there's uh, stuff that's not included just for, uh, say, paper. But if there is a, going back to the suicide piece, if there's a hypothetical book that provides 
guidance on how to commit suicide, and there's a 14-year-old who wants to check it out, and the librarian sees this, I, I understand if this were to pass, they wouldn't be able to talk to the parents. Would they be able to call the police or anything? Is, are there any exigent circumstances in which a librarian could not be prohibited from disclosing the information? Um, librarians, so, and this is, this is the case as far as I know across the board, what people do with the library is, is private and there is state and there is federal law, there's federal law around that. We would respond to a warrant. We would not, we are not mandate, librarians are not mandatory reporters in the state of Vermont. And, um, the, if I, I'm, I think this reaction of mine is in the, the idea of that book. I've, I've been in libraries since 1999 working as a professional. I've never seen a book of that type in a library, and I can't imagine that it would meet the selection criteria that we just established in the, the prior thing that we were talking about. I, know, sorry, I can't imagine that particular what book. Yeah. What the concern was that phrase. Yeah, so, no, I understand, yeah. but... Um, I think typically the information that is shared in a in a book in a library would be factual medical information um, that's vetted and scientific and um, resources that would be given to a child who asked a staff member would be um, the staff member would then in, in my experience working with um, many many um, youth experiencing homelessness in the lgbtqi community on the streets of san francisco i worked in the eight ashbury neighborhood the kids would come in and they would be struggling and i would walk them to the clinic for for medical help and i think that the librarian in vermont helping them would would take a very proactive stance toward encouraging them to talk with their families encouraging them to get help that's part of what we would do just as humans with a referral but also giving them factual information to address their specific mental health, medical, or or drug concern that they were trying to deal with on their own. Mr. Anderson, thank you. Just going to very quickly respond. There is nothing in the enumerated list that has been ellipsed out in the bill. Oh, okay. That would, I'm, I'm, I'm it. It, it would allow a oh. librarian to disclose confidential patron records. Yeah. There's one quick caveat on that, which is that uh, school library records are available to the custodial parents of any child, regardless of age. So if it's a school library that you're dealing with, the parents can always access those records, and that's because that's governed by federal law per book. And it's a student record that's available to the parents. What are you doing at 345 tomorrow? You come back? I can come back. 345 tomorrow? Yes. We've got our uh, an issue related to um, an issue, but a topic on deaf and hard of hearing. I know we've hired after somebody did you sign and why you put it on the time. Yes, uh, the center field. Do you have a, a fun? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. We're just going to take a minute free. I was just going to say, um, I'm in this provision, which yeah. I'm in favor of, uh, but I sense, and not this is not geared toward any of my colleagues here, but I generally in health and in the health and welfare world and in this world. I, try, I often get the sense that there's a lack of trust in the experts, right? In the in the doctors who are administering care to 12 or 13 year olds, and in this case, the librarians, having been one, it's like you know they know their job, they understand what they're doing, and um, there's a certain amount of trust that we have to have in both of those professionals. Uh, and I also just wanted to say that it seems a little disingenuous to be focusing our discomfort in with this age when it comes to libraries and yet I feel that kids are accessing much more harmful content on the internet let's say that is really it's sort of they can get their hands on all kinds of things that are so I would I personally would rather focus on how do we getting back to Dr. Levine's comments you know how do we regulate the platforms that our kids are on and the content that they're getting there versus kids in the hands of a of a professional with years and years of study and experience who really can guide them thoughtfully through accessing materials. So I, I just wanted to highlight that um, dichotomy as well. So I, I'm just, I support parents knowing about what they're 
12 year old child's doing. And if, if, they, if they're doing something that's causing harm to the child, we got laws in place to take care of that. So we're going to judge all parents in this case based on a few that are violating the law and abusing children. So that's that's the last thing I want to say. So please, uh, just just in response, I, I respect your position, but I, I also think that what we're lacking is uh, trust in the parent. That to me, that's the crux of the problem or the crux of the dichotomy of opinion, okay? The, the second thing I'd like to say is that what we're talking about is state-sponsored, state treasury used for programs. That's the difference between somebody picking up their cell phone and independently looking at material as opposed to uh, uh, the library, which is, you know, it's states, it's, state funded so in those completely different worlds anyway, that's that's where i see the difference the only advantage of not finishing is that we have an opportunity to talk to you again tomorrow look forward to it great thank, thank you thank you thank you Bye. okay can let's take five minutes and then we're going to shift to senator hashim uh for an update